Hello. Okay, we go ahead and get started. So thank you, uh, everyone, for coming uh, today. I'm really excited to, um, you know, do this presentation and have my guest, uh, Yolanda uh, Harris, today uh, to speak about, you know, uh, celebrating and understanding you're not the New York neurodiversity um, in the workplace. Uh, my name is Tamika Sitchin Spruce and I am uh, the lead in a uh, director for FDRC. And so I'm going to uh, share my screen so I could just share a little bit information um, about a lead in and FDRC and what we do and then we'll go uh, straight in. Uh, straight into uh, the conversation with Yolanda. All right. So again, thank you uh, for joining us. Um, so we welcome questions. Um, I did um, ask, you know, if you had questions um, prior to uh, to this meeting um, to, you know, please let me know. But you know, if you do have a question that might come up, uh, please put it in the chat and we'll uh, try to get to it uh, later on after um, the conversation. Uh, please um, also, when you have a question, uh, you can uh, put it in the chat or uh, like you can uh, unmute, unmute yourself, raise your hand or type the question in the chat. Also, um, if, if you can rename uh, yourself, please add, please add um, your preferred pronouns to your name. And so this will help me um, properly identify you. Um, we also have an ASL interpreter. Uh, so you should be able uh, to see her. We also have live uh, captioning. Uh, this presentation is recorded and it is supposed to be streaming on uh, Facebook, but you know things happen, so I will uh, post it um, after this presentation is over to uh, the Michigan Disability Rights um, Facebook page. Um, the presenter will give her a, a visual description and image, and we also. Uh, we'll send the slides out and record it to those who have registered. Um, again, so uh, today I will be facilitating this conversation. Again, my name is Tamika Sitchin Spruce. My pronouns is she, her, and hers, and I am the lead director. Uh, I am a brown skinned woman uh, wearing um, a black sweater and uh, have, um, have black hair and kind of red tips. Um, and then uh, my, our special guest is Yolanda Harris, and she will uh, I'll share a little bit more information um, in a minute about her. Um, so the purpose today is to give those um, who are in organizations more understanding um, about neurodiversity, but that also it will um, help in, you know, uh, people who are neurodivergent as well, um, as far as their rights and how to um, thrive in the workspace. Uh, so at DRC, um, our mission is uh, to cultivate disability pride and strengthen the disability movement by recognizing disability as a natural and beautiful part of human diversity while collaborating to dismantle all forms of oppression. Um, Lead In, again, is a direct uh, is a program that I oversee. So I work with uh, nonprofit leaders um, in Michigan on disability inclusion, in particular uh, for those in the BIPOC uh, communities. Uh, the funding is for Michigan Developmental Disability Council. Again, the agenda today, we're going, uh, Yolanda will share basic understanding of what neurodiversity is, highlight the ways managers 
get people in place of power, get create an inclusive workplace um, environments for neurodivergent individuals, and give advice. Uh, so Yolanda is a, a great um, a woman. I met her through LinkedIn, and so she is a force of change uh, in your diversity space. Um, she is driven by a deep passion for unlocking the unique talents and perspectives of neurodivergent individuals. She champions inclusion of all aspects of life. Uh, she's dedicated to manifest a multifaceted career encompassing leadership, advocacy, education, and action. Uh, she is a CEO, a training phase consulting group, uh, where she empowers um, organizations to embrace neuro inclusion and fostering workplaces where neurodivergent individuals can thrive. Um, she also uh, founded a nonprofit neurodiversity inclusion institute um, to further amplify her impact. And uh, she has over 35 years of experience in human resources and talent management, including uh, leadership and chief organizational development officer, where she uh, equipped nuanced understanding of organization dynamics. So I'm pleased to announce and um, bring uh, Yolanda Harris to the space. So, Welcome, welcome, Yolanda. How are you? How are you doing today? I'm I'm doing wonderful. Just really, really nervous right now. Um, I don't do a lot of interviews um, or chats or anything like that. I'm typically just behind the scenes um, when it comes to working with my consulting business and now newly formed nonprofits. So you have to forgive me. Um, and, and just excuse the, the nervousness. And I guess it's a good thing when people are nervous because at any point, if I stop being nervous, uh, then I need to stop doing what I'm doing. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, this morning it was very challenging because my, I guess you could say my computer just froze on me and I'm looking at the time and the time is still 1026 on my on my laptop. So mm. I have no idea what's going on. And, and I was um, I was actually looking, you know, just kind of practicing and just kind of rehearsing my talking points. And I'm looking and I was like, oh, my gosh, my lips look so chapped. I need to put lipstick on. <laughs> when I went into the uh, bathroom to put my lipstick on, I glanced at my clock in the kitchen. I was like. Oh my gosh, th this is horrible. <laughs> so, so right no, now, okay. uh, no lipstick. You know, this is just me and all my um, in in all my natural self. But thank God for filters on <laughs> uh, on Zoom. <laughs> so, if it wasn't for the filter, I would be looking as as you know, I would say a hot mess right now. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah. Yes, you look great. You yeah. you look great. Thank you. Uh, and, and so, forgive me. I, I see chats that will kind of pop up. So it's not that I'm ignoring you or anything like that. It's just that um, one thing, and, and I'll explain more in terms of my condition when it comes to distractions. Um, that's just something that um, it is, is my one of my challenges. And I, and I am always fully transparent. Um, but when it comes to distractions and things like that. So uh, without further ado and taking you up a hill around the block, uh, to get to a point, <laughs> I guess so we can you get did. started now. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Thank you. So the the first question I have for you is, uh, what is neurodiversity? Well, um, neurodiversity. It's really what it means to me. It's just basically how people think differently. Um, there's no right way or, you know, there's no one right way or a specific way in terms of how to learn or to act. And when we look at conditions like autism or ADHD, um, it's just basically our brains operate differently. So I've come to learn that um, upon my diagnosis and I've get more into that is that it's nothing to be ashamed of. This is just how my brain has always operated. Um, and 
the other conditions that are considered that some people would say neurodiverse that falls under the neurodivergent umbrella would be a person that has autism, such as myself, um, ADHD, attention, um, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, but we all know it as ADHD, uh, dyslexia, dyspraxia. Um, there's a condition called dyscalculia and also Tourette's. So it's really important to remember also that these are just a few examples um, that falls under the uh, neurodivergent umbrella in terms of having that condition. And one thing I do want to add and in terms of my condition itself, when I was originally diagnosed, it was Asperger's. And now it's just considered part of the autism spectrum. So it falls under the umbrella term of autism. And also another term that it's that I that's less preferred to use that I don't like to use um, is called high functioning autism. And because autism affects everyone differently. For someone to say, oh, you're you you must be high functioning, that downplays the, the challenges that someone may face if they're looked at as being high functioning or high functioning autism. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, I know that's can we moving away, not say Asperger's anymore, especially understanding, you know, where it came Yeah, and there's from. a history yeah. behind it, but that's yeah. another, that, that's another, that, I was going to say that's another show, but that's another, uh, a, a, that, that could be, a, yeah, another show, in other words, yeah. uh, to talk about Asperger's and the history of it. Yes, 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 and try to measure, you know, who with high function, low function, and all that, so glad we're moving away from that and just say this is who I am. This you know, think differently and it's 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 okay. Yeah. So uh if you can share uh a little bit about your employment journey because uh just based on you know talking with you, I know that you uh was uh diagnosed at a later age as an adult. So if you could just tell us a little bit about your employment journey and how that was for you prior to your diagnosis. Well, my employment journey uh, was challenging. Um, sometimes I get emotional over it. Sometimes I laugh about it um, when I reflect back on my employment. But yes, I was diagnosed at the age of 58, uh, 2018. And when I say that was a very eye-opening experience for me, it explained so much about my work history. And one of the biggest hurdles that I had, one of the biggest challenges, and I still do, again, full transparency, um, has been masking. Um, basically, in other words, trying to act normal to fit in. Um, and so it, it was like wearing a costume all day um, to have you know, the, the small talk to force myself to look people in the eye, um, social cues, it, it was really confusing. And it was, I would always say things like, okay, I'm going to fake it till I make it, or it's showtime. And I would really have to kind of convince myself to, in other words, be normal, um, you know, and I want everyone to keep in mind that's on this um, on this call here is that I, I always want you to keep the top of mind is that I received a late diagnosis. So it wasn't like I just woke up one day and said, you know, I think I'm going to, I think I have autism or I think I'm going to be autistic. I have been this way my whole life. And so it, when it comes to the masking and things like that, I have learned now after my diagnosis, and again, that was very challenging because it was hard for me to accept. Um, and so what I've learned to do is to really em embrace it and to research more. That was, for, that was the first thing I did. I started researching it. Um, and so by doing that, it slowly, the acceptance came. I accepted myself, but over time, 
I realize even now there are still others who will not ex- who who are not accepting of it, and it's not a, a bad thing. It's just that they're not aware. They don't understand. They don't know, and so that's you know, what I talk about when I work with organizations and and schools and, and just individuals just trying to, you know, educate them and share with them the importance of, you don't have to understand it, but at least educate yourself and, and just do some research and talk, talk to us. <laughs> we're, we're okay. We, we will tell you. Um, I, I will tell you. Uh, now that I've kind of put it out there. So when it comes to um, the masking part, there were days where I would just hit, when I say it feels like hitting a brick wall. And because it was so much that was going on. So now, so then what I would start doing, even in my employment journey, not even knowing I was autistic, I would look for jobs where I could be myself and really focus on my strengths. And when I started doing that, when I say I thrived, I thrived, still not knowing what was going on, but I knew there was something, I knew I was different. Um, And I just took that and and I just said, hey, this is who I am. I'm just gonna be who I am, like it or not. And when I say I focused on my strengths, and it, it just, my my career, you know, wherever I work, whatever I did, it just started taking off. And um, that I, I'm, I'm really, you know, proud of that to say that about myself. So I hope that was enough information, uh, you yes. know, about myself. And I know time constraints and things like that. Uh, so I will definitely try to keep it brief because I will go on and on and on. And you're gonna have to try to ease your way and find your way into the conversation. No, 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 no. No, it's good. And and what they got was listening to you and that you were, you know, once you uh focused on, you know, the, like your strengths in these that that's when you thrived and you flourished. And so I know another thing that um, that you really advocate for is neuro neuro inclusion. And so can you share a little bit about what is neuro uh, neuro inclusion? Well, when you think about um, in terms of neuro inclusion, uh, what that is, that's just really being able to just have employers, the community, just uh, to be able to have everyone have a sense of belonging and to make sure that, you know, you're creating a space where I like to say everybody's brain is welcome, (laughs) you know, and so for, for, for example, you know, if everyone, you know, and yes, everyone's different. We all think differently. And the best part about neurodiversity and inclusion that we, we call neural inclusion in the workplace is that, for example, it just means that understanding these differences that we have and just making those adjustments so everybody can succeed. You know, um, so when you look at someone in terms of a physical disability, you know, the workplace will make certain adjustments. So now we're talking a um, a condition in terms of our brain and how it works and what we need to be able to thrive and to work, be successful in the workplace. And, and that's the key word, accommodations. And so just because when I walk into the workplace and you don't see my disability, um, it, just know that if I choose to be um, transparent and to share with you what's going on with me, then at that point, it's the role of the employer to, to ask someone like me, well, what do I need? And I know, you know, those questions will come in terms of what types of accommodations and things like that, but it does vary uh, with that each with that individual. So that's what neuroinclusion is, and, and neurodiversity and inclusion is just basically creating that safe space where everybody 
is welcome, where all brains are welcome, regardless of what cognitive um, style. It could be your cognitive thinking style and things like that. And to be successful on the team. So I hope yes. that helps. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And so how does, how would a, a employer create um, a more welcoming and belonging space for people? Um, well, one of the things that they can do, employers can do is, first of all, just to have that understanding. You have to be able to train your staff on neurodiversity. Um, for example, like autism or ADHD or dyslexia or, or Tourette's in the, in the workplace. So everyone can really appreciate the different ways of thinking and working. Um, another thing, and, and when I mention all these things, I'm really thinking back and reflecting on what I needed um, in, in my previous uh, workplaces that I did not receive. And it's not because, and, and primarily because they didn't know, I didn't know. And so one of the things is always, um, again, um, clear communication. And when I say use direct language uh, for me, um, when it comes to things like sarcasm or complex instructions, uh, that can kind of, that can be confusing to someone with, uh, who's neurodivergent. So if we ask, if you have an, empl an employee that says to you, but they still may not disclose it. If they say to you, well, you know, we, we just had this meeting and, and I appreciate you giving me all of these instructions. I would really appreciate if you can just put it in writing, you know, for, for reference. And so I like to have things put in writing um, because it takes time, um, may take time for me to process the information. And if you want me to come back and to provide you with, you know, something that's going to be, you know, magnificent, 100%, um, I go through everything detail by detail. So if I say, you know, well, you know, if you can just put that in writing or if you can communicate that in writing as a follow up, um, I would really appreciate that. And I found that that has worked um, for me. And even in when I in my consulting and when I'm just having meetings with everyone, with people, I just say, can you, you know, we, we just met, but if you can just kind of put that back in writing for me so I have a clear understanding. So when I do workshops and when I'm working, you know, with other companies, these are things that I ask for. Another thing in terms of being the, it's called, you know, sensory awareness. Offer uh, flexible workspaces, for example, quiet areas if you have them, or allow adjustments like noise canceling headphones to minimize any distractions. Or it, one of the accommodations could be, well, you know, working from home. And I will tell you when COVID hit, um, when everything shut down, I, I remember, you know, being in, in Detroit when everything shut down and we, we had to work from home. I will tell you, neurodivergence, you know, someone like myself being, on, you know, autistic or having autism, it was probably one of the best things <laughs> because we were in a space where there were no distractions. And when I say thrive, we were able to thrive. Um, and so when we talk about those accommodations, uh, again, flexible work hours, um, one of the things is allowing uh, fidget toys that can help someone focus. Yes, as adults, we love to do things with our hands and fidget toys. I have a whole box of them. Um, it, you know, here in, in my space that I use. Uh, so these are just things that, um, that, that could be helpful. And so again, as a consultant, I go in and I work with companies to help them create those spaces, you know, for their employees. Yes, yes. And I see Lisa had a good question that leads into what you were, um, say as far as like pretty belonging spaces and the benefits of it and thank you for the accommodations 
um, you know, that employers could do. Uh, but Lisa asks, would, would you say that Belogi, uh, Belogi leads to improved productivity in the workplace? And then what impact does exclusion have on productivity? I will tell you, um, when it comes to being productive and we're giving, um, you know, when, when you create that safe space for us, when you uh, offer those accommodations, and when I say we thrive, we thrive. Um, one of my last assignments that I did, you know, in terms of working um, with individuals in the workplace, I, I also do coaching for neurodivergence. And one of the things when it comes to coaching, it's really important for them, you know, and for them, for us to, again, be able to have that understanding of what we need. Um, like I said, and when we don't get that, or when that does not happen, yes, we're talking, it could be low productivity, you know, it, it could be uh, low productivity. So to exclude us or to exclude someone that's neurodivergent or, or anyone with a disability to, to exclude us and not be able to create that safe space, we're going to, um, and I'm using myself at, as an example, um, there are times where, you know, I would, you know, it would affect my, my productivity because of something I'm trying to think, an example of where I may have felt, um, you know, when the anxiety kick in, kicks in, for example, being forced to attend a, a company event. And in, in my past workspace, I, I had to attend so many uh, company events and didn't want to, you know, so that should be okay. And I recall that there were times when I would advocate for myself. And this was when I did fully disclose after my diagnosis, I was working somewhere and I explained to um, you know, my leader that, you know, when it comes to doing the social thing, you know, don't really like doing that. And, and, and then to be labeled as being antisocial. Okay. Yeah. Or, and, and to be reprimanded for that saying that, you know, you did not, you know, you, you were appearing to be just, you know, non-sociable. You weren't chatting with your coworkers. You won't, weren't doing this. And to, to have that, to that pressure to put on me again, it's like, okay, so you're telling me now I have to put my mask back on and I have to fake it. And when I tell you that it's it's causing um, the anxiety, it's causing a lot of um, undue stress on me. And there were times when I think back that uh, to attend certain meetings and I'm, I'm not with those employers anymore, but yeah, I would call in sick <laughs> because I did not want to be at that meeting, you know? So, and, and again, by me not showing up at that meeting, but I could have, you know, but to be able to put my notes together to, you know, put, you know, what I had done on this project and then to say to one of my team members or a coworker, can you present this for me? Things like that. Um, so again, this was my experience that I'm speaking from. But when I tell you, when I found out what was going on with me, I was better able to get the, you know, have the right resources. I was able to get a coach myself. I still have a coach. You know, I still have someone that coaches me and works with me. Um, so I'm better able now to navigate my way into being able to sit at a meeting and to um, be able to, I guess you can say, socialize more. So it goes both ways, you know. So we're not asking that, you know, when it comes to accommodations that you all just cater to us. We're going to do our part. 
you know, and, and again, I'm speaking for myself, I'm going to do my part. Um, and I will tell you once that safe space is created and I say we thrive, you probably have the most loyal, the most loyal employees, uh, ever. So yeah, that, that, yeah that's yeah. it. Yeah. And, yeah. and again, I know I'm talking a lot and, no, this uh, is great. No, because you, you did send me some questions in advance. And, and again, full transparency, everyone. She sent me the questions in advance. I wrote down my talking points. I said, I'm going to stick to the script. And then I look over in the chat and I see some comments and questions. And then I want to answer those questions. And so this is what I mean by um, in terms of how my brain, my brain operates. So you can give me a hundred projects and tell me, give me a time frame and when they have to be done. I know a hundred projects is a lot, but say if you gave me five projects and, and that had to be completed, again, be specific. Tell me when you need it, create some details, you know, create those details. And when I tell you it's done, it's done. <laughs> Yes, no, you're doing great. And yeah, thank you for giving us, you know, the insight. And so um, I know there are some employers and nonprofit leaders on the call with us. So, you know, everything that, everything that you're saying is definitely uh, helpful and give really a great perspective on, you know, how to, to, to really create an inclusive um, um, space. And so, you know, the going back to the question uh, that I sent you, um, so what should an employer do if they are uh, maybe suspect that they might have an employee that might be uh, neurodivergent if they see, you know, they struggling or a little bit and don't like to come to meetings or different things like that. What should an employer do? Well, uh, the first thing you, you don't do, don't directly ask about a diagnosis because uh, you really have to respect that employee's privacy and employers can't diagnose employees, uh, but they can be open to whoever choose to disclose a neurodivergent condition. So re remember, if you think, if you suspect, you know, don't say, oh, you know what? Oh, okay, I, I bet that person is neurodivergent or I bet that person has autism or, you know, I'm going to do they have ADHD. You know, what you want to do as an employer, you want to focus on creating a work environment that works for everyone. OK, not just neurodivergent individuals, but everyone. So when I say I advocate for everybody, I advocate for everyone. Um, uh, again, you know, offer those uh, when it comes to communication styles, whether it's written, verbal, um, you know, so you have to be flexible with the different communication styles. I used to uh, teach. Um, I was DISC certified. And of course, you had the different. Um, you know, styles, the way people would, would communicate with each other. And, um, you know, so being open to, you know, things like that, there, there's so many uh, training uh, programs that are out there that I have taught when it comes to, you know, comes to colors, I, I teach uh, cognitive thinking styles. So to come into your workplace, and again, you have to know what their preferred communication style is. It's okay to ask. Um, you know, for example, allow also allow for quiet spaces if needed um, in, in your, your office or your, your company. And if you see an employee that's struggling, talk openly about finding those solutions together. Um, you know, again, I've also worked in HR, so I, I know what it's like to work in HR and when working with HR and my, uh, last, uh, project that I had worked on and consulting, it was with organizational change management and working with HR, um, you know, we may want to say things like, okay, well, this employee is struggling. Let's put them on a performance improvement plan or PIP for HR professionals out there. Um, before you do that, 
I, I would I would say if you see the employee is struggling, again, talk openly first about finding those solutions together. And when I can tell you this helps all employees, not just neurodivergent employees. So it's it's really important. And again, you can't do not try to diagnose and you cannot just say, hey, you know, I, I was just kind of watching and observing. Are, are you are you autistic, Yolanda? If someone were to say that to me, um, <laughs> you know, I would be like, huh, what? <laughs> I would really be taken aback by that. And again, um, for me, if they came to me now and said that, I'd be like, well, you know what? As a matter of fact, yes. And so let's have that conversation. But what if that employee is not? And they're, they consider themselves as someone who is normal to a person that's non-neurodivergent or, you know, non-autistic or normal that, and I don't know if they would be offended by that or they would, you know, what would go on in their mind. But again, as employers, you cannot do that. And I'm, I'm looking at the chat, by the way, and I exactly. see you know, exactly. some, some of those comments if you want to stop and we can um, yeah. answer those. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that does go. So we focused on like what employers can do, you know, to create a lobby space and accommodations and what not to do, you know. Um, so as far as with the employees and some of the questions, you know, are in the chat. Um, and then the questions that I sent you. So, like, so really, what does um, uh, should an employee uh, like with during the hiring process? You know, what should um, a person who's you know they're a divergent autistic should they you know um, disclose to their employer? Uh, you know, to help them understand better goes to uh, Kim's question. I, I always say, uh, hey, Kim, <laughs> and, and Kim and I used to work together. We, we used to work together and um, I, I appreciate her so, so much because when we worked together, um, I didn't know, she didn't know, and I'm sure everyone else at the place where we worked did not know either. Um, but yeah, it, it was, um, I, I think when you're in a, yeah, she just said she never knew. And I, I attribute that to a lot of the masking that that I did un, unknowingly n prior to being diagnosed. Like I said, I've masked pretty much all my life. And so um, when you're interviewed for a position, and, and I that's a tricky question uh, because I have done that once when I was uh, when I did receive my diagnosis, and and then I would go on interviews. And I would give that full disclosure now that I think back on those employers that did not hire me, <laughs> but I knew, I knew I was qualified. I was so to the point where I, I, I would say, you know what, maybe I was just overqualified and that's it. I recall during having an interview and it was a panel interview. Um, and it was the second phase of the interview. So the first phase I did disclose and the, the hiring person uh, leader, she said, well, I'm gonna move you on to the next phase. So um, when, we, when she did that, it was a panel interview. And I will say that's probably one of the worst things for us is, is a panel interview because you're sitting there and you're looking at all of these faces. And even now, you know, during COVID and, and when it was on Zoom calls to see all of these faces on the screen and to have to try to, focus on each one and then our brain is just all over the place, it was really hard to focus on the questions that was being asked. So getting back to your, your point, Kim, is that um, it, it's totally up to the individual. Now, again, what I do in terms of coaching, um, I do work with some individuals that are on the autism spectrum that are where I do coaching for them and helping them to, um, to be able to, again, navigate their way into the workplace. So, and, you know, along with other life skills and things like that. 
And so we do teach them things. You know, I do coach with them on, okay, this is what you're going to say. This is how you may want to say it because someone with autism like myself, you know, we can be very direct. You know, we can come across overly direct as, as people would think and to the point where it's perceived as being rude. That's our personality. That's our brain. And that's what I think some people do not understand in terms of our directness. And so, um, again, if you're, you know, if you look at the applications and they ask you, you know, to voluntarily disclose, you know, you can say, I don't want to answer. So it's totally up to you. However, if you do decide to disclose, make sure you really focus on your strengths and, and share with them what you do bring to the table, what you, you know, um, in, in terms of the skills base, talk about your skills, what you're able to do. And then again, we all know that by law, you cannot discriminate against someone that has a disability. Um, but do we really know that that's why you received that um, reject email? And, you know, getting back to the, the one employer, and it turns out when I gave full disclosure and I was looking at some of the faces, this was pre-COVID, pre before COVID. And to sit there and to look at the panel, some, you know, now that I reflect, when I would reflect back on that, some of them seemed intrigued by it, while others, I couldn't read their facial expressions. It was just like, you know, I'm thinking to myself, should I have disclosed? Should I have said something? And it yeah. turns out the interview was me giving a, a, a I, I was, it was like I was facilitating oh, a, a no, session. That's not good. Yeah. And, and, and so it was like, okay. And I walked out like, oh my gosh, I know I'm not going to get it, you know? And so maybe I shouldn't have told them because then when I tell someone and give that full disclosure, the passion comes out and I talk about it more and more because I want people to understand that it is not a, you know, of course, disability, it's an ability that I have and being neurodivergent, you know, some people say, oh, that must be your superpower in terms of the skills and what I'm able to do. Yes. So yes. I, I don't know if that answers your question, Kim, but yeah, so it's up to the person. I would say if you are going to disclose, make sure you um, have someone, a, a support, someone to work with you, someone that can provide you with some advice on how to go about into that interview. There are ways you can do it. And one of the companies that I, um, I'm contracted with where I work with the adults, we have a process where we actually work with them, you know, in terms of job skills. Yes, yes, yes. And I know we have about 10 minutes to go. So um, I have one question I get to you, um, Lisa. So how should a person, um, what, should, what should a person do if they suspect, uh oh, okay, okay, just make uh, myself froze for a minute. Um, so what should a person do if they may suspect that they are discriminated against? What should a person do? Well, um, that, that, that's a very good question. And I did see that um, because someone, uh, at Sandy, at Sandy asked, do yes. I ever feel discriminated against when I disclose my disability? And um, I don't wanna say I feel discriminated against. I will say that I noticed that, and again, it, it's all due to not understanding or lack of education. And that is why it's so important that training, you have to train employees and managers and, and leaders and hiring leaders on, you know, what, when you're working, when you're interviewing someone um, that is neurodivergent, you know, or, you know, to make sure that there is no discrimination. 
I was able to, as a consultant, I was able to work with a company where I took them from a 10 step process and we streamlined it to five steps. And I always make sure I incorporate uh, when it comes to, um, you know, bringing, you know, our bias, um, our, our bias thinking into the interview as well. So what does a person do if they suspect, again, they, you want to make sure you talk with HR, you know, because I'm sure there are cer certain policies and procedures that are in place, um, you know, when it comes to discriminating in the workplace. So your best uh, resource that I can think of at this point is that you do want to go through the, uh, the, the proper channels or the proper protocol um, when it comes to bringing HR in. I'm, I'm no HR expert, I've worked in HR. And so, but by being a consultant and having my own consulting business and the nonprofit where we educate, advocate, and we do research, um, that that can be a whole nother, um, you know, side yeah, conversation. Um, <laughs> but if you're looking at in the workplace, if you suspect or you think you're being discriminated against, the best course of action is to uh, contact HR. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, Lisa, uh, what is your question? Thank you so much, um, Yolanda. Thank you so much for being here today. You are, um, I, I respect your work so much. I've been a big fan. And oh, um, I wanted to commend you on your, your talking about psychological safety and how important that is in the workplace. And as far as neurodiversity goes, you know, we oftentimes think of autism as being a culture. And so with that being said, I am autistic and I have autism spectrum disorder. I don't define myself as having Asperger's. That is an outdated terminology that mm -hmm. hasn't been used for many years. And it's an overgeneralization of language disorders that are a hallmark of, neuro, uh, of autism. So I don't use those terminologies just like you do. It is truly a spectrum disorder. It but is. I am autistic. And I'd like to advocate a little bit more for neuro, neuro-inclusive workspaces. I heard you talk a lot about the accommodations process and you know, having access to different things like things in writing and being able to work from home. But when we are in the workspace, some things that we can do to be neuro-inclusive would be to have different areas of the workspace that were designated differently. Having spaces that have comfortable seating and different lighting, having spaces with cubbies, having spaces where there are different tools like televisions, radios, and other meditative rooms, um, and just flexibility in our attendance how we arrive and bring our best selves to work is critical to having a neuro-inclusive workspace. So oh my I, gosh. I really just wanted to expand upon that and thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you, Lisa. I love you. I love you. And thank you so, so much. And, and everyone, everything that she mentioned and talked about and the fact that she's being tr fully transparent her voice are the voices of so many other employees in your workplace who may not disclose for fear of, again, being discriminated against for the, the, the stigma. Um, and as everyone constantly, you know, may be looking at what they would consider our deficits and not our skills. And I, I will tell you, education is, is, is the key. And to ask, talk. So whoever is at Lisa's, you know, at, at her workplace, talk to her, ask her, um, because it's so, so important. And when you do that, and I will tell you, and I know we're running, I, I don't know, we're running out of time because my, my clock still says 1026. So <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Um, 
<laughs> but yeah. I, I, I will tell you, it's it's really about communication, and and that's that's the key. And just to hear someone to to be able to advocate and to to the self advocate, and that's number one. And it's not that you know we're saying that you know hey you're going to do this, Mr. Employer, you're going to do that, Ms. Employer, we want this, we want that. It may come across that way because maybe you've never saw that side of us before where we're now being more, you know, I would say definitely assertive in our advocacy work and what we do. And when I tell you, and speaking of LinkedIn, I'm sure that there may be some other LinkedIn colleagues that are out there and and thank you for the support and, and being here But when I tell you what I did uh, when I was on LinkedIn, I I was given the advice, Yolanda, you now have to find your tribe or find a community that's going to support you. And that's what I did. And when I went out and reached out to the neurodivergent LinkedIn community, when I say, oh my gosh, I, I, I was like, I'm not alone because I really felt alone and by myself when I received my diagnosis. And when I tell you the individuals that I have met and have come across, you know, on 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 LinkedIn, and and I want to uh, say this uh, to me, one of your questions that you sent me to share some a few well known people who are neurodivergent. Uh, Again, everyone, if you just realize that there are so many of us that are out there, um, when you, you, we've heard, you know, Simone Biles, you know, she has ADHD. Um, I'm I'm taking you back old school. Jerry Seinfeld, I used to watch his show all the time on television. He shared about ASD, you know, having autism spectrum disorder. Did, you know, for those of you out there, and I'm, I'm talking multi-generations now, Quest Love, for those of you who are a fan of Quest Love, he yes. he has ASD, he's autistic. Um, for those of you who are in like the, the, the skating community, the roller skating community, um, the, one of my uh, LinkedIn colleagues, his name is Kyle Push Dutcher. Um, and, and for those of you who are on social media, um, he's a member of the, um, what, what do you call it, the Silver Fox Squad, for those of you who are on social media, but he has an organization and he talks about being neurodivergent and, and having Tourette's. There's um, uh, someone, yeah. I, I know Lamar Hartwick, who's called the Autism Pastor, you know, um, so these are just a few you know, individuals, Amanda Gorman. Do you all know who Amanda Gorman is? She was that beautiful young lady that, that at the, at the inaugural that, that read that poem, you know, she has talked about her auditory processing disorder. Yeah. yeah. There's so many people. Yeah. And when I say, when I started reading and educating myself, I become I, I become so passionate and so excited. And so that's that explains the birth of the nonprofit that I have. And, and I know you can provide that information. And I know we must be out of time. Yes, we're out of time. <laughs> yes, yes. But but thank you. I thank you very much for you know coming with me, coming on with me and you know, speaking, uh, giving us advice and and you know, as also, you know what what we could do as, you know, on the community to create more of a place of belonging and inclusion. Um, so, and I thank all of you for joining us today. I also put in the chat, we want to, you know, hear your feedback. So please uh, fill out the evaluation form. And, and I, can, yes, go and, ahead. And, and, and so Aaron Shannon, I, I see your chat, reach out to me and we'll talk. <laughs> okay. So that, that's all I can tell you at this point. Reach out to me and and let's let's talk about it, okay? Because there is a solution. Uh, uh, again, we're just in a, a space right now where it's not, um, you know, don't want to. But Aaron, call yeah, me. <laughs> and I also I will put it's of uh, Yolanda. If you want to put your um, information 
in the chat, you, you know, you're welcome uh, to do that. And I will send out uh, Yolanda's information as well. But Yolanda, we're welcome to put your um, information in the chat. Okay. Yeah. Do I have time? Do I put it in now or just? Yeah, you can now. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, let me. Oh my gosh. Again, again, the, 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 like I said, that these traits are, are kicking in in terms of doing all this. I'm going to put the links in there. Hold on. Uh, so here's the uh, link to, uh, hold on, to training phase. And I'm going to put that in. And I'm also going to put in the link to the our newly formed uh, nonprofit, where, like I said, we focus on advocacy. We advocate, um, we educate, and we do a lot of uh, research. And it's called the Neurodiversity Inclusion Institute. And um, hold on, I'm putting this in there. And definitely, um, you know, so go to the website, sign up. Um, we're, we, like I said, we work with uh, companies forming neurodivergent uh, employee resource groups. And we also work with um, higher education to form neurodivergent uh, student organizations. And I don't know if I should be putting in this plug, but next week I'll be at um, OCC uh, at their campus um, to see get see if there's an interest in forming a neurodivergent student organization, um, you know, at at the school. So uh, shout out to OCC and and Dean Stacy Cruz and 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 um, oh, oh my gosh, uh, Re Re Rebecca, um, thank you, everyone. Thank you so, so much. Okay. I, I thank you everyone for coming. All right. Bye. Bye.